Greetings, Clarifiles and Clarifilets. It's been a while since I've actually done a video, and I'm sort of out of practice, so I'm you know, constantly looking at the monitor, talking with you instead of looking at the camera, which is actually in kind of a dark place. But anyway, uh, you may be wondering about the title of this article, and I want to discuss it a little bit later, but first of all, I want us to engage in a little exercise. I want us to pretend that we're a parent and that we've had a child come home from school very excited about playing in band. And they've announced that what they want to play is the trumpet. And so you don't know anything about music yourself. You've always been involved in some other field. But you say, okay, well, that sounds good. I mean, child should have a musical education, you know. So that's great. So we'll go down to the local music store, like the band director said, and see if we can rent a trumpet to see if your child's going to like it. All right, great. So you head down there and you announce at the music store that your child's excited about band and is ready to play the trumpet. And uh, do they have a trumpet that they could rent to us? And the uh, guy behind the counter says, absolutely. So he just disappears by, uh, behind a certain door and then he comes out with this case and he opens it up and he says, Here's a great trumpet we can rent your son. And he shows you this. What would you think about that? Mm. You'd say, I can't. Look, that's a piece of junk. I mean, look how dull it is. You know, that, that looks worse than the old, old trumpet that my uncle kept in our closet for years and years and the valves didn't even work. We need something else. And he says, I know just what you mean. I know what you're looking for now. So he comes out with another case and opens up, pulls out the trumpet and says, what do you think about this? And you say, wow, that's great, Tommy. What a wonderful looking trumpet. With a trumpet that looks like that, you're going to play great. Yeah, scenarios like that are repeated tens of thousands of times each year here in America. Why? Let me explain. The problem with the parent is the hierarchy of values. The parent doesn't know anything but what he's able to see with his eyes. This shiny bright thing, that's the thing that's really cool. And the dull thing well, I don't know. That doesn't look very good. And even if he saw Wynton Marcellus's picture, he would say, I don't know who that guy is, you know. But he needs to play a better trumpet, one shiny like this one. So this has to do with, again, a monolithic hierarchy of values. And that one monolith, that one value that the parent has is based on what? On sight not on the ears, not on how the sound of the instrument is, not on how the instrument feels when you play, not on the tuning, not on anything, just that it's bright and shiny so it must be good. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because my son got on the internet and he found that there's some uh, guy who's a clarinet maker who received a Libertas clarinet an old Libertas clarinet, and I know the clarinet he's talking about he's, because he's complaining a lot about the plating, going on and on about it, making a mountain out of what I've always thought as a molehill. But uh, anyway, uh, he did mention, as an aside, that the clarinet seemed to tune really well, but otherwise was worthless. Really, a clarinet that tunes well is worthless. I find that to be an astounding comment. Like, it's almost so like, it. well, it did come with a nice case. Uh, but nevertheless, I did, by the way, and he probably doesn't know this, I did a, a, a demonstration several years ago of the Libertas clarinet, a tuning demonstration with a tuner. And I challenged anybody to match the tuning qualities of the Libertas with any clarinet at any price. Just challenge them to match that if they could. And no one ever did. 
no one ever matched how well the clarinet played. Just to give you an idea of how well the clarinet played, with no added mechanism, which other clarinets require to approximate this, there was no FC, low F to C, no tuning spread on low B and a bell B, a low E and bell B. There was no tuning spread between thumb F and high F. No tuning spread. You didn't have a flat thumb F and a sharp high C like you do on most clarinets. You didn't have a flat uh, uh, first line E and sharp uh, high B like you do on most clarinets. The tuning ratios had basically been fixed when you played over the middle break. You didn't have like threat, flat throat tones uh, and very sharp right hands. Uh, the resistance balance in the horn was astoundingly good. Playing smoothly over the middle break was hardly any resistance change at all. Bell B came out beautifully clear. And then when you played from left hand, right hand to left hand in the clarinet, the pitches were all round and full. And there was no need to half hole when you played over in the third register. Now I'd say those values in themselves are a lot more important than plating. I'm not saying that a clarinet shouldn't have good plating, uh, but I'd say in your hierarchy of values that those performance qualities, the tuning, the evenness of resistance, the evenness in tone color, the smoothness of intervals, wide interval leaps in and out of the registers, I'd say those are much more important things. They're certainly much more important things in my hierarchy. Now I will say this, that also, the other thing that's not mentioned is the material itself. Now, in the Libertas, as in our new clarinets, they're natural hard rubber. And the hard rubber is an extremely, unlike wood, which he makes his clarinets in, natural hard rubber is an extremely sta stable material. It doesn't change, not just from season to season, but from year to year. This clarinet and other hard rubber clarinets that we make will play for you 15 and 20 years as long as you take care of the of the clarinet mechanically you, you have good padding in it and you're lubricating the mechanism and have the keys swedged and whatever that are as needed over the years through use common common things that happen with clarinets the clarinet's going to play the same it's not going to blow out i know harold wright talked about his own clarinets that he played he said that every, you, between every six and eight years, he would change clarinets because the clarinets would blow out. He, it was the term he would use. They would blow out. And Robert Bloom, uh, when I was going to Yale, uh, I studied clarinet with him. He's an oboe teacher. He's a wonderful musician. He said the same thing about oboes. He said after, after six or seven years, maybe even less than that, the oboes, he, the term he used was lose their juice. This doesn't happen with hard rubber clarinets. This is a tremendous value. Now, with our new clarinets, like the Libertas II and the Oreo clarinet, we have silver plating in the clarinet. The clarinets are made extremely well. The key fitting, the joint fitting and everything is top notch and the clarinets play like a dream. We just got these clarinets in. So all of these things are so much more important than going on and on, especially about a clarinet that is not even made anymore. It has nothing to do with what we do. It's like complaining about Yamaha trumpets that have red rot. Well, their brass hasn't had red rot for decades. So I'd say try to get up to date, at least communicate with whoever it is. I mean, I, I've played this guy's clarinets, but I haven't played them for over a decade. Um, so I can't even begin to comment on how good his clarinets are. He says they're really great, but why wouldn't he? Um, so, uh, but the ones I played, uh, I can only say the ones that, that he's making now, I hope, I really hope, they're a real acoustical improvement over the clarinets that I played of his 
years and years ago. And I'm sure that he's made improvements. We made improvements too, like the Aurea and the Liber Libertas too. Uh, we worked a long time and we finally, finally found a maker who has made everything with great care and with great precision and done the acoustics just the way I want it. So it's a top-notch clarinet. So anyway, that's the reason I'm talking to you about your hierarchy of values. Because as a clarinet player, you don't want to be uh, basically in the position of that parent who only knows what he sees. Uh, you have to really understand the clarinet and not be led around by, uh, like a sheep because the people that are leading you around like a sheep have no qualms about slaughtering you to take every penny you've got for shiny, bright things. And I will say about plating, by the way, even though these new clarinets have beautiful plating and everybody that we've sent them to and we sent them to some real experts on this, they talk about how beautiful the plating is and everything how beautiful the keys work. It's true, they do look beautiful, but I'll have to say this, in my own estimation, one of the coolest things that I saw was a uh, clarinet years and years and years ago when plating was a difficult thing to get, apparently in Europe, I saw uh, a Buffet R13 that a student had that was in the high school, same high school, not the same high school was in, but he was in a high school in the same county. Uh, and the clarinet didn't have any plating, and it really looked cool. I thought, that, that looks great. Why can't I get a clarinet with no plating? It doesn't need plating. You know, why is there any reason to have plating at all in the first place? And, you know, the only answer that I can give, even now, is to say, it's just cosmetics, and it's cosmetics that the makers can upcharge astronomically for. Like, for instance, the the Aurea here has beautiful silver plating and everything, but we don't charge any more for it than we did for the Libertas previously that was only nickel plated. So, and there's no reason because our cost isn't more, and when our cost isn't more, we don't charge you more. That's it's just that simple. But the really cool thing about the clarinet is the way it plays. It's like it's fantastically good. Uh, it's got uh, an acoustic that is uh, what I think is an improvement over the acoustic of the uh, 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 of the Opus clarinet, Opus Concerto clarinet that I designed at LeBlanc. It has some improvements in tuning. It has uh, some improvements in response, uh, and it has uh, improvements in the depth and roundness of the upper clarion pitches, and the transitions are better. Uh, over the upper, um, into the left hand of the clarion, into the lower part of the third register, the altissimo. So uh, anyway, but that's that's neither here nor there. My point is, uh, is really the title of this video. What is your hierarchy? And I think you have to answer that question. What is your hierarchy of values? And as a professional clarinet player, you need a hierarchy that is, at the very least, not monolithic, not based only on one or two things, especially on the visual part. That's, that's my point. And after all, the clarinet is not, you know, wasn't made for Bennigan's. And if you recognize that reference, you're as old as I am. But in Bennigan's, they used to hang musical instruments on the wall, okay? The clarinet's not to be hung on a wall and everyone look and say, oh, look how shiny it is. The clarinet's to be played. And that means that the hierarchy of values has to do with its actual performance qualities. And that's where you need to test instruments. And that's where you need to put your real values. Uh, so just think, whenever you see an instrument, especially an instrument with a lot of bells and whistles, that's nice and bright and shiny like this Aurea clarinet is, you know, ask yourself, did you ever see anyone while you're walking at a concert say, wow, that was great. Did you see how shiny the plating was on that clarinet? That was wonderful. I'll never forget this performance because of that shiny plating. 
I never did.